Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along to our uh, seminar talk for today. Uh, today we've got Federico Calate, who's coming from uh, Baraja. He's in fact the CEO of Baraja. He's going to come and give us a little bit of talk about um, some of the LiDAR systems and the technologies and the kind of uh, journey that's gone on in Baraja. Uh, Federico is the founder and CEO of Baraja and his role uh, evolved from a co-inventor and an engineer lead to a position of setting the overall vision for the spectrum scan technology, the company direction and keeping a keen emphasis on the product strategy. Federico was born and raised in Lima, Peru, and he obtained his degree in electrical engineering at UPC before moving to Australia and obtained his master's degree in technology management from the University of Queensland in Brisbane. Uh, he's got a diverse background in product development and systems engineering. His extensive experience in industry knowledge spans across industrialization of high volume telecommunication devices at Finstar at Motorola and end-to-end -end systems design at Cochlear Implants. And while working in the optical telecommunication industry, Federico with his co-founder, uh, is it Chibi or Sibi? Sibi, Sibi uh, observed that the industry leveraged the color of light to miniaturize and cost down the switching elements of the network, which increased capacity and reliability. And the two used this concept and paired it with a prism-like optics used as a steering mechanism for LiDAR, which is now known as the spectrum scan system that we're going to hear a bit about today. Thanks, Federico. Yeah, thanks to be here. Um, <clears throat> so we have been working with the University of Sydney uh, and the ACFR for a few years, at least this is not the first time I come here. Um, but I thought it would be good to, to give you an update of where we are and I think also about where we see the industry going uh, next. And what I'm going to present today is of the first results of an instantaneous Doppler point cloud created with LiDAR. Uh, and our LiDAR uses two other things that are quite unique. Uh, the measurement technique or ranging technique is called RMCW, random modulated continuous wave. And the way in which we do steering is also quite unique, uh, solid state spectrum scan. So uh, this is the first time in the world that these three core technologies have come together producing a Doppler, a natively Doppler point cloud. Um, several of you might already be familiar or very familiar with uh, LiDAR point clouds. Uh, for those of you who are not, uh, or for any of us that need a refresher, this is a point cloud uh, specifically coming from the Baraja Spectrum Scan LiDAR. So as you can see, it's high resolution. Uh, it's really long range. So our, our system measures over 200 uh, meters at, at dark objects. Um, and this is taken in San Francisco. So don't worry, we're not driving on the, other, on the, on the incorrect side of the road. Actually, you can see there, there's a way more self-driving car in front of us. Uh, so that's that's uh, a typical point cloud from our generation one uh, product. <clears throat> and today I wanted to cover uh, where we're going, um, which is combining three unique approaches to make a world first. Um, I already alluded to, to some of these. So spectrum scan is the unique way in which we're scanning or steering the laser beam without moving parts. Random mod modulated continuous wave is the way in which we do ranging. Most other people do false time of flight. And uh, the detection, we're transitioning from a direct detection system that is set is basically a photodiode sensitive to the intensity of light. And we're moving to a homodyne detection system that is sensitive to the intensity and the phase of light. Right? So the full uh, electromagnetic field. When you combine these three things, uh, we've managed to produce the first Doppler from a homodyne RMCW LiDAR. So let's go over the three key components. And uh, my aim is to leave ample time for questions and, and conversation at the end. Yeah. CB Pulikasari, my co-founder, uh, he's an uh, alumni from, from University of Sydney. He did his PhD here uh, in optics, but I think it is part of the electrical engineering school, I think. Um, so that's, that's him and I in 2015 in my garage. We had quit our job at Finisar uh, around, so this is August 2015. Uh, we had raised about 100K uh, from 10 friends, family and fools, FFF, friends, family and fools, 10,000 each roughly. And I remember we spent about 50,000 50, in, in this uh, benchtop laser. 
uh, about $30,000 on top of that on patents, that acquisition cards and stuff like that. We, we had an idea, uh, but we wanted to prove it to ourselves first that it had legs. And the idea was in a way simple. We had been working in a company called Finisar, uh, the world's largest manufacturer of optical telecommunication components and subsystems. And over there, we got exposed to a new type of laser, semiconductor laser, a tiny laser. What's special about this laser is that it's able to change color or wavelength. But in telecom, you use these uh, to, to reconfigure the network and you do this very infrequently, three, four, 10 times a year, maybe. And what uh, C and I invented at Baraja uh, was the ability to get this laser to change color millions of times per second, accurately, repeatably, time and time again, over vibration, shock, temperature, all the things that this laser would encounter if you were to mount it on a self-driving vehicle. And we thought, hey, if we could, could somehow pair this wavelength tunable laser with prism-like optics, we could be achieving steering without moving parts. So the idea is, it's exactly that. It's very, very simple. You go back to your high school physics. You remember when white light goes through, through the prism, the prism opens the light into its color components. If you were to shoot one color at a time, then each color gets routed into a different angle, thereby you are steering without moving parts. You're using the physical property of wavelength to get the light to route itself. I'm using color here as an analogy because it's not visible light, it's infrared light. Uh, centered around 15, 15 nanometers. But the principle of operation is the same. When we change the color of this light, shoot it through prism like optics, we achieve steering without moving parts. And why is this important? Well, every other LIDAR has moving parts. Either they steer or they spin around the lasers and the receivers, or they put either a polygon scanner in front of the laser and the receiver, uh, or they put a galvo mirror or a MEMS mirror. All of them are moving parts. And these moving parts are prone to failure. So when we remove it, the system reliability goes through the roof. Uh, they're bulky. So when we remove it, it allows us to miniaturize the system and they are costly. So when we remove it, it allows us to cost down the system. It has many other advantages. If you imagine yourself being the light going through the prism, you're gonna realize that there's a direct dependency or relationship between wavelength and field of view and resolution. The higher, the, the number of wavelengths, the higher the resolution. And we have absolute control of the, the wavelengths. Uh, in the spectrum, we can create typically up to 2,000 uh, individual wavelengths. We can choose where we want to put sparse or dense resolution as well, and dynamically change that as the driving conditions evolve. So imagine going from an urban driving environment to a highway driving environment where you want to place maximum resolution at the distance in the horizon after you've determined that there's nothing in the blue sky above you and there's nothing dangerous in the, in the direct ground in front of you. Uh, and you can change this constantly without any wear and tear because you're just selecting different colors of the, in the laser. Um, here's a demonstration of, of this in real life. So you can see we're dynamically changing the the foveated region from top, center, and then bottom um, in a round robin fashion. How you would use it is, well, you would track, for example, uh, the pedestrian as, as he moves away from the, from the vehicle. Uh, that requires pairing with a perception engine, and we call that cognitive LiDAR. And here's an example of a really high resolution point cloud taken with our system. This has 2,000 vertical pixels. So 2,000 discrete wavelengths are being accessed. The point I wanted to make here is that to have high resolution, you not only need high resolution or high uh, pixel count, you also have to, you have to have small pixels. Imagine a high resolution image in a computer, but where the pixels, pixels are large, you end up with a pixelated image. Well, the equivalent of a small pixel in LiDAR is the beam size. Having good beam collimation ensures that the, the instrument, which is your laser beam that you're using to sample the environment is, is fine, right? And you would like this to be as fine as possible. Uh, that has to be paired with good range 
and that has to be paired with good resolution for you to be able to reliably detect the small objects at a distance. So you need range, you need a small beam or good beam collimation, and you need high resolution. If you want to, on top of that, integrate frame over frame, and you want to end up with a, an image that makes sense, then you also need good angular accuracy. Otherwise, again, you would end up with a blurry image as you integrate several frames. At a glance, the company Baraja is uh, about 160 people. We've got a team in Palo Alto, a team in uh, Detroit, a very large team here in Sydney, in North Ride. Um, and uh, well, by now we have over 70 patents awarded. We've raised over $75 million USD. Um, and we have some of the most uh, reputable investors in the world. Um, so let me tell you about some of the advantages of spectrum scan, because I'm still on the topic of the spectrum scan, how we steer the beam. If, if you are using any other LiDAR, and all the other LiDARs use a mechanical steering method, as I was describing, either they spin the lasers and receivers, or they put a galvo or a polygon scanner, all of those scanning methods are analog scanning methods. There's no way a mirror can move from this position to the next position without going through all the positions in between, right? What that means is that when you are scanning an object at a distance, imagine 200 meters, you are measuring the distance to that object at 200 meters. But as you are trying to measure and integrate that, you are also moving the laser beam. So you're not scanning one thing, you're scanning the arc that is described at 200 meters by that tiny motion of the mirror is between one and six meters. You're integrating a lot of stuff. So angular resolution is irrelevant unless you have something like a spectrum scan. Why is a spectrum scan different? Because it's a digital scanning method. Spectrum scan doesn't change color gradually from one color to the next, it hops from frequency to frequency. So we place the laser at a given color or wavelength, which means we're staring at a certain point. We complete our measurement and then we instantaneously hop to the next point, complete our measurement. So while we're measuring, we're not moving the laser beam. Yeah, did that make sense? I hope it did. So we have a very crisp point cloud, whereas with every other mechanism, you end up with a blurry point cloud. So I'm gonna now, um, give a few examples of um, the world of academia. This, these are the top two universities in the world that have been doing research on miniaturization and uh, cost down of LIDAR. And for a long time, over 11 years, they were heralding, the, uh, or they were saying that the way of the future was to go to a technology called two-dimensional optical phase array, similar to what you have in radar, but in this case, it's in the optical domain. Um, in the year 2018, they realized this wasn't going to work. And they pivoted their research and they acknowledged you require spectrum scan. So here's MIT and UC Santa Barbara. And I can give you uh, references to the papers when they realized they needed spectrum scan. So this is three years after we had already founded the company. 2018 is when we actually had put out our first product in the field. Do you mind if I jump in with questions along, along the way? Yeah. What's the main limitation of phased arrays? Several limitations. First of all, um, the number of elements that you have. Um, so the, at the moment, the technology is not advanced to have more than say 64, 100, 200 elements, which means that you don't have very good beam formation, which means you end up with one big fat beam in the center and lots of side lobes. And those side lobes, so the, the, the fat beam in the center limits your resolution and your side lobes, uh, what they do is, the, the problem is if, you're, if your main lobe is pointing to a dark object and your side lobe is pointing to a bright object, the bright object is gonna dominate and you're gonna represent uh, the distance of the bright object on the side lobe in the position of the main lobe in the center, just as an example. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, or the other problem is that at least in one of the axes, these are thermally tuned and that is not fast enough for the type of applications we're doing. 
it's also really difficult to control that real time or vibration shock and temperature, which are rapidly changing in, in automotive environments. Ultimately, I think uh, the, the other big part is that it didn't, it didn't adapt well to long range. Um, it, optical phase arrays is, is part of the solution. It's the steering out. If you want to steer the light back in on the receiver, I think that is a, a very big problem as well. So moving away from academia into, into the industrial world, uh, Dionier is a, tier, a Swedish American tier one company. Tier one companies are companies like Bosch, Magna, Continental, that are the traditional suppliers of the automotive world. Dionier is quite special in that they don't do car seats and seat belts and, and, and airbags. They only do advanced electronics, radar, cameras, driver assistance, yeah? And they had a lot of experience with LiDAR because in 2017, they had partnered with Bellalab. Very quietly, that partnership didn't go anywhere. They discarded that partnership and they spent over a year searching the world. They started looking at over 70 companies, including all the publicly listed companies. Uh, they down selected to nine LiDAR companies that they took on a benchmarking of three to four months and they selected one, which is Baraha. This is a red green yellow chart of Baraja here against the other eight companies that they evaluated and the different technologies, right? So direct time of flight, FMCW flash, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that Baraja has no red and most of the green is yellow. So now I'm gonna move to a second part of, or the second component of the technology, which is RMCW, random modulated continuous wave. So, LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. And most, the, the, I guess the more, the more uh, traditional technique for ranging is something called pulse time of light. So you shoot a short duration of, of uh, a short pulse of light, and then you count the time for the light to travel there and back. That gives you an estimation of the range to, to that object. Um, who can think in the room of a uh, potential limitation of pulse time of light? What could be one uh, drawback of that technique? The size of the width, the pulse that you can produce. Okay. So it can be it can be challenging. It can be challenging to produce a narrow pulse, yeah? and you would want a narrow pulse because it affects your resolution in the ranging. Yeah, that's a good. And as as we know. Um, the narrower the pulse, the higher the bandwidth on the electronics required to generate that, but also then the higher the bandwidth on the receiver electronics to be able to process that. That's that's a really good point. And bandwidth is correlated with cost and complexity. Uh, what what's another key drawback? Yeah. Eliminating it constantly. The energy that you're putting on the project. Yes, 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 yes. So, so the amount of energy that you can include in the pulse, you're right. And if you want to maintain the same amount of energy in a narrower pulse, then you need higher peak power, which is also something that the industry is hitting limits on. But I, the, and those are real uh, limitations. The, the main limitation that uh, is seldom, seldom spoken about is interference. Any light pulse coming back can be interpreted as my light coming back and it creates ghost returns, ghost point clouds. Uh, in some cases, this can happen even with sunlight, but even if you take sunlight out, when two or more of these self-driving vehicles run into each other at an intersection, they're shooting high power lasers into really sensitive receivers and this causes uh, a disengagement of the self-driving car. It asks the human driver to take over and the number of disengagements per kilometer driven is a key metric of performance in self-driving. So this is one of the key limitations on the wider adoption of pulse, of, uh, pulse time of flight light. Conversely, we use a technique called RMCW. And if you recall, my background and CB's background is in optical telecom. Our laser comes from optical telecom. It was designed to transmit 10 gigabit per second over fiber optic networks. So we're just using that ability innate to our laser, and we're carving out a modulation, a binary sequence into the light. 
when we shoot that light, let's call it a symbol, when we shoot that light, that code, it's very easy to then, when the light comes back, to determine that it's our light, our code, our symbol, not anyone else's. So that's one of the main strengths of RMCW. Even in the crazy event where two of our own lidars for a fraction of a second were to match angle, color, the symbols are not going to match and there's not going to be any interference. Yeah. This is research from a Korean university doing uh, LIDAR to LIDAR interference studies. And they determined that our MCW here in the red dots uh, has 3 dB better, uh, is 3 dB more robust against interference, two times better against interference than competing ranging techniques. The other techniques are uh, continuous wave, FMCW, and pulse time of flight. Yeah. So RMCW is more robust, two times more robust e against interference even than uh, FMCW. And on top of the FMCW, there's a synergy with a spectrum scan because on top of the codes, we have the only way to couple the light back into the system is if it comes back from the environment matching color and angles. So in this case, blue light can only couple back and be folded back through this through the prism into the receiver if it comes back from the correct angle and color. Red from the top, green from the center, blue from the bottom. Yeah? So that's a synergistic approach where spectrum scan and RMC always start helping each other. So that is a key consideration when you're designing one of these systems. Uh, number one is interference. Uh, and then, well, you could, you could try to solve it by algorithms or by optical filters, but in this case, spectrum scan itself is an optical, angular, and wavelength filter, which means we can use very simple receivers with very low noise. Uh, and then the third one, yeah. yeah. About the random, uh, yeah. How, how random? Is it an engineered pseudo-random sequence? Or is yeah, it's, that... a, it's a pseudo-random sequence, yeah. yeah. M codes? Like it the... can be an M code, yeah. It can be a, yeah, a golden code. It can be a, not, not so useful. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but those, those uh, have well, good properties of side load uh, rejection, yeah. Cool. Okay, and then the last point, and this is, this is so whereas the two first points, Spectrum Scan and RMCL have been with us from day one, right now we're transitioning from direct detection to a homodyne detection. Does anybody, has anybody heard the term homodyne detection? Yeah? Roughly, what, what have you heard? It's how a radio works. <laughs> how radio works, yeah. To, to down convert, for example, with a local oscillator. Yeah. Yeah. Modulate. Yeah. And modulate. Yeah. Also, it's kind of like camera. Okay. I didn't know that. Good. Uh, so, so um, in homodyne, in direct detection, you have basically a photodiode that uh, converts light or photons into a current. And then after that, you have a stage called a transient amplifier, a TIA that converts the current into a voltage that then you can read in an ABC, for example. Um, in homodyne detection, you have also a photodiode. That photodiode also receives the light coming back from the environment, but you feed that photodiode also with a local copy of the light that you sent out. Basically, your laser, a part of it goes out into the environment and you tap off a little bit of that and put it back into the photodiode. When the light coming back from the environment mixes with the with a local oscillator light, it generates a filtering effect and an amplification effect. So it means that you can be very, very sensitive. So what are some of the advantages? Well, yeah, you can be very sensitive. How sensitive? Single photon sensitive. Uh, and it also means that because you're more sensitive and, and you're filtering out all the other light whose frequency doesn't match exactly the frequency of your local oscillator, you have also no noise in your receiver. And this makes it amenable to miniaturization. The challenges are that it typically requires a high custom, high purity laser. Uh, you need a laser that is as close to a single tone laser as possible, right? And, and lasers are very pure light sources, but they are not single hertz uh, line width, right? They're, they're kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz. Um, and 
you can become susceptible to some a type of noise called speckled noise. Has anyone heard or, or handled speckled noise? It, it can also happen in, in cameras, right? When you're very close to the to the limit of uh, of sensitivity. Okay? Well, so speckled noise becomes a real issue when you're going to home alive. At Baraja, we one of the, the main uh, issues we we spent the first five years of the company working on was on how to solve speckle. Uh, and if any of you knows Fernando uh, Diaz, he's also ex University of Sydney, but he's been working with us for a long, long time. Uh, he's uh, one of the main contributors to how we solve speckle at the physical domain. A lot of people try to solve it on signal processing. And there's a lot of merit to that, but we've solved it at the physical, the optics level. Um, what I'm showing you here is a point cloud. This is a far away point cloud. We're, we're shooting buildings in the distance. This one is about 300 meters away. And you can see that we're losing lots of points. All of this phase of this building is completely lost. The same system, the exact same system at the same position, the same buildings at the same distance, now inserting the, com the optical component that solves the problem of the speckle, you can see all of these points on the face of the building going back. So speckle is very tricky because it's not that you don't have enough signal to noise ratio to make a detection, is that randomly at some points, the face of the light coming back destructively mixes with the light of your local oscillator. And even though you might have good signal to noise ratio, they destroy each other, you lose. It's similar to fading, yeah? So we solved that problem. When we put all of these three technologies together, um, because homoline detection is, is sensitive not only to the intensity of light, but also to the phase, hence the problem of the speckle. Well, there's something else you can start doing with that. Once you're sensitive to the phase of light, you can start determining um, the, the Doppler shift of the light coming back. So, uh, why would this be important? Well, as you can imagine, determining the velocity of the objects around the car is quite important for a car, right? So you, you wanna know where things are and how fast they're moving. Some of the things that you could use this information for are, for example, if you're doing slam, well, you can directly subtract anything that is moving and then you do slam on anything that is not moving because that's your field environment, your row, your buildings, right? So it simplifies the task of filtering for SLAM. Or after you use SLAM, you might wanna create critical rules to your um, control system, for example. And one of the critical rules might be anything that is moving fast, you wanna pay attention first, right? Uh, so velocity being instantaneous, uh, an instantaneous and an inherent quality of the point that would be helpful for this. And finally, for, for more practical things, well, everybody is calculating velocity and how they do it is they have to accumulate several frames and then do the diff and that is processing intensive and memory intensive. I mean, I mean that's probably fine for academia, but for volume produced autonomous vehicles where you're maximizing or optimizing the cost and the power consumption, that is really not acceptable. So the fact that our LiDAR can produce that natively saves hundreds of dollars and power and several tens of watts in power consumption. So here you see Tom is walking towards us, Miu is walking away from us, and the van is coming first towards us and then steering away from us. And you're gonna see them represented in a Doppler point cloud where blue is negative velocity and red is positive velocity. So you can see that dynamically changing on the van and you can also see Miu on red and Tom in blue. And here I have a, a very similar one as well, where I got the guys to just walk in a circle and you can see uh, the smooth transition. You might also be thinking, hey, it's very noisy, right? There's, there's red with the blue, but that's how we actually walk. The average velocity is probably positive or negative, but our shoulders and our hands are sometimes moving in positive or negative velocity. Um, to give you an idea, here, we're shooting light at a given color, centered around 1550 50 nanometers, in, in hertz is 191 terahertz. And we're detecting a change in the frequency of that light caused by the people walking 
of one ten million of the frequency of that light. And that's how sensitive the system is to be able to create this Doppler point. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up and maybe have some time for questions. Um, some of the key technical advantages of, of the spectrum scan LIDAR are, uh, well, first of all, you can have almost, almost infinite resolution because you can select discrete wavelengths in the spectrum. Typically, we go up to 2,000. You can select where you put their high resolution, so we call that foveation. You can, uh, you can get per point Doppler velocity, and we have very good effective range, and that is, as, as a way of remembering, that is good range plus good beam collimation plus high angular resolution and accuracy. Uh, we have solved the problem of interference, both by RMCW and spectrum scan. We, we have a digital scanning method, so we don't have a blurry point cloud, and we've solved the problem of the speckle. And things that are enablers for all of this is, well, we have um, the ability to have a, a clear roadmap to an end game, low cost, high performance system built on solid state and automotive durability. I actually forgot to bring it here with me, um, but I, I usually carry this in my pocket because it does fit there. And this is the line that, that we're working on. And so you, you, I mean, I get excited by the technology, but um, if you take the technology aside and you say, well, what does it enable? What, what it enables is a very small, high performance, low power consumption device. And when we talk to the car manufacturers, that translates to them uh, to the point where they can put it on as many vehicles as possible and in a, in a place that is inconspicuous behind the windshield. So behind the windshield is a great vantage point. You get cleaning for free, de-icing uh, for free. Um, and uh, the design studio of the car manufacturer loves this because it doesn't break the aesthetics of the vehicle. You don't need to end up with a vehicle that looks like a John Travolta kind of Purdue with a lighter on the roof of the car. This is completely uh, hidden, seamlessly integrated. So um, that's the Baraja lighter. Thanks, Federico. That was fantastic to learn a little bit about the, that special kind of technology at the Spectrum Stand. Uh, any questions from the audience? Um, I was so, wondering, so you use the spectrum for the vertical resolution. How do you get the horizontal resolution? There is a mechanical steering method for the horizontal, but that is not a mirror. It's not moving the laser. It's not a polygon scanner. It's not a gal. Or it's something else that we've invented. Uh, that we've got a patent for. It's extremely robust and it, I, I cannot disclose exactly how it works, but I can tell you that whereas a polygon scanner, for example, uh, is typically spinning at 10,000 RPM, this object that we use for horizontal scanning moves at five Hertz. Different from a Galvo or a MEMS where you have acceleration and deacceleration motion around a single pivot point, our mechanism is completely encased and held, and it has no acceleration or deacceleration. It's, it's moving at five hertz constantly, and the mass under motion is also very, very low. So, uh, as a matter of fact, the first generation product already has this, uh, and we've qualified that already to automotive and mining standards. Got a question online from Ooh. Steph. Hi, Stefan. Hi, thanks, Federica. That was a great talk. Um, I can sort of imagine the, the outward path when you're shining the laser through the, the prism and splitting it into wavelengths and, and using that. You didn't, maybe I missed it, but you didn't say much about how you do the capture element and how that impacts on the resolution of the scanning. Can you say a little bit about, about sort of that side of the, of the scan? Yeah. I, think I, I, I think I did. Um, we, okay, we can go back and, and cover that and see if uh, if it makes sense. I mean, it makes sense to me, but sometimes that doesn't make sense to everybody. So let, let's go over that. So in the same way, and this is, is a key component, a key aha moment, right? Yeah. Using spectrum scan to transmit is very obvious. Mm -hmm. I really think that the 
power of the technique is on how to use it for the receive. So when the light comes back from the environment, it gets folded through the same optical path through the prism and into the uh, fiber coupled photodiode. So a single fiber coupled photodiode is used to receive the light from the entire field of view, up, down, left, right. Why? Because the light coming back gets folded back through the same optical path. As, uh, Note that I said a single fiber coupled photodiode. Fiber optic, the core of the fiber optic, depending if it's single mode or multi mode, is 50 micrometers or nine micrometers. It means that you have to really precisely be matching color and angle to be folded back and coupled into a fiber optic receiver. Yeah, which means really you're rejecting most of any other light that is not your own light. Now, this would be extremely difficult if you had a bi-static system where Tx and Rx are separate because any vibration temperature shock would very slightly misalign Tx and Rx and this would not be possible. What we have is a coaxial or monostatic design where it's impossible to get Tx and Rx ever to misalign because they are the same thing. So did I cover your question, Stefan? Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, Don? Uh, a very practical question. What sort of accuracy do you get on your velocity measurements with your Doppler? So these are- It's very complementary, especially when the actual sensor is full. Okay. Do you mean, do we compensate for echo motion? Is that what you mean? We don't. I mean, we could, if you, if you were to give us the velocity, of course, we can subtract it and then the accuracy and resolution is gonna depend on what we receive, but at the moment we don't. Uh, the car itself knows its own motion and they subtract that uh, from, from, from this. Um, accuracy and resolution. Well, the key thing is you wanna be able to detect pedestrians. And what we hear is, that the, and, and this is not proven, this is you know, a hypothesis that, that the self-driving car companies are trying to, to demonstrate is that they feel if you, are a, if you are able to get Doppler resolution, not only to detect pedestrian walking, which is about three kilometers an hour um, or lower, if you wanna detect, I don't know, an elderly crossing, the, I don't know, one kilometer an hour. Uh, so that's, that's what people want. Uh, but I've heard also that detecting then lower speeds to be able to detect, you know, the person is walking in one direction, but the shoulders are beginning to turn around or the head is beginning to turn around, that might help you with predicting future intent. But that is something that is not proven. Um, but when I get requirements, uh, kind of wishful requirements from my customers, that's, that's what they would like to get. So I, I, I would say that three to five kilometers an hour is, is good. Uh, three kilometers is certainly good enough, uh, but you, there, there's a hypothesis that if you can get sub three kilometers an hour, it could be even better. Uh, what we are detecting here in, in those videos that I showed you are probably three. I mean, I didn't measure how fast these people were walking. They were not walking fast at all. So I, I would say three plus, remember we're only detecting radial velocity. So, um, so for this person here, it, it's even if he were walking at three kilometers an hour, the fact that he's already not walking towards me is, is discounting that velocity. Um, our- do you, do you reckon you get similar accuracy top of frame and bottom or the wavelengths of the Yeah. Yeah, because the, the Doppler is just the shift on the wavelength. Um, yeah. and, and our spectrum change is actually quite narrow. Um, it's only plus minus 20 nanometers. It, it's tiny. In, in optical telecom, they just call it 1550. So that, that's, they don't even say 1550 plus minus 20 nanometers. So. Ian, that you have a question? Yeah, it was, it was kind of on the same topic, but. Um, you mentioned already that the, the Doppler measurement 
has some advantages over doing kind of differencing on repeated range measurements in terms of memory and compute. Um, but have you also compared the accuracy of those? Um, not, not me directly, no. Um, but I would love to hear your opinion on this. Um, I guess uh, from one perspective, I mean, just taking finite differences of signals mm -hmm. is very, very sensitive to noise. So often we use kind of more than just a couple, right? You use several. I mean, it strikes me that if there was opportunity for some extra memory and compute, you could actually combine the two. If you've got repeated position measurement and a velocity measurement, there would be um, you know, a simple chemical to, to um, combine the two into something that gives perhaps a better measurement of velocity than either of them on their own. But, that, but then you would be throwing away the advantages of the lower compute and the um, mm. memory requirements. So <laughs> some, something that, yeah. that sounds similar is when people talk about using stereoscopic vision to measure distance. Mm. And I think it does work. The difference of using that versus LIDAR is that LIDAR is a direct physical measurement of distance, whereas the other one is an approximation. Mm. Uh, so I would maybe offer the same, the same to this, right? Accumulating and then doing the diff between frames would always be an approximation. Um, Whereas this is a direct physical measurement using, you know, one of the fundamental constants. <laughs> yeah. But the fact that it's a different source of information with uncorrelated errors to yeah. kind of differencing things that it's no, potentially the, the, more, the more important yeah. thing, uh, even though each one of these measurements could be error prone, let's make the assertion that they are very noisy. How many points you have on a car or on a pedestrian, right? And then you can, uh, if, if you were to use it for segmentation or, or so, yeah, for, for segmentation and classification, let's say, well, you know that all of these points are moving at the relative same speed, therefore they must belong to the same object. That, that's one basic assumption you can make and you don't need to be very precise around the velocity. Uh, and then, yeah, well, so some some things like that. I, I do think that there is um, well, and then you can you can improve your velocity estimation frame to frame as well. But you already determine that they are part of the same object, or that they are part of a built environment for the purpose of slant. Any other questions or questions from online? Or Tom, this might be a silly question, but uh, if you have the light going out of the prism and then coming back to the same channel. Uh, it's very easy to be able to do the outline. Outline. Um, no, because you we send one color at a time. So we go red, shoot, measure, receive, then green, point, shoot, measure, receive, then switch to red, and so on and so forth. Um, but you have to be mindful of a case called range folding, range aliasing, anyone? Yeah. So for example, if I point, shoot, measure, and I get nothing because in this direction, there was something, let's imagine something very bright, like a, like a stop sign, but it was outside of my instrumented range. So instead of it being at three, up to 300 meters, let's say it was at 600 meters, by the time I stop listening in this frequency and I move on to my next one, I'm shooting here and I might be receiving the echo from the previous point. And even though, uh, yeah, and, and then that, that gets incorrectly presented as a short range in the next point. But in that case, the, the object has to be far away. It has to be very bright and it would have to dominate over the next point yeah. and there's techniques to solve a bit of that and uh, having RMCW is one of these techniques because you can use not just one pseudo random code you can use several pseudo random codes so I can generate an orthogonal code to shoot in frequency one and then I can use a, another orthogonal code for frequency two and so on and so forth so even if they do come 
on top of each other, you can suddenly wait and say, ah, wait a second, this is coming from my previous position and this is coming from my next position. And that is the only way to cheat the speed of light. It is, because one of the fundamental problems of LiDAR is if you wanna have high resolution LiDAR and you wanna use just one laser and you wanna be able to use it to shoot as many different positions as fast as possible. But if you're switching very quickly, then your range is very shitty, right? So if you have orthogonal codes, you can move to the next position and still be listening to the, to the previous positions. So it is really the way to cheat the speed of light. A question from Steph on my end. Yeah. Another thing that struck me is is one of the big challenges with moving into sort of autonomy on the roads is is operating in inclement weather and rain and fog and you know snow. How, how does the system perform in that? Are you relatively immune to things in, in like interference like that in the environment? Well, I think the, the, yes. The, the key part here is we're able to position the, the system. Uh, behind the windshield, right? Between the windshield and the rear view mirror. So you get de-icing, defogging, cleaning for free already. Uh, anything that is at the service of the driver and our eyes is gonna be at the service of the LiDAR and the cameras in this case. So uh, the second part is that it's at a higher vantage point than say um, where light, legacy LiDAR has been placed, which is on, on the bottom of the grill. So, but just by being there, you have a better vantage point. You're less prone to getting dirty and obstructions. Uh, but at the fundamental level, this is still an optical system. So anything that impedes light will mm. affect it. Having good beam collimation can help here because if you have a beam that is and a, and a receiver aperture that is larger than the obstruction, then you always get some light out and some light in. Um, so systems that are based on, for example, on MEMS will have very bad beam collimation. And I would expect them to perform more poorly, um, poorlier, I don't know how to say that, uh, on obstructions. Um, at the same time, you could say, hey, they're all LiDAR, they're all using light around the infrared, they're all gonna be struggling with the same thing. So, um, the industry is solving this not by making more robust LiDAR or, or yes, I guess, but also by also having radar and cameras and stuff like that. Uh, there's many other reasons why you might want to use that as well. Uh, for example, a camera can see color and we cannot. So whereas with LiDAR, you can detect that there's a car in front of you. You cannot tell if it's a taxi. And that can be very important because taxis break frequently and they break the rules. So you might want to factor that in, or if it's a police car, hey, the police car might do something crazy, right? Because they, they light up the siren. So color is important. Um, so that's something. Great, thanks. Any other questions, uh, Ali? Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It's a very good presentation. I was watching from the Zoom and I thought I should come to ask questions. On one of the, I think, the very early slide, you have a prism and uh, there is an incoming uh, laser. It changes wavelength, therefore, considering the refractive index, the refractive index of the prism is constant, it stays, which is, you know, this is what the fundamental principle. Yeah. What happens, or how practical it is, if you keep the wavelength constant, but try to modulate the refractive index of the prism, or you know, the, the prism, or doing both of them simultaneously, especially you know, in case if you can change the refractive index of the prism in such a way that you can actually change this true wave value by doing so, you can actually steer the wave up and down as well. Sure, I think it would be a great idea, but at the moment, well, but then you start going to more exotic prisms, where at the moment our prism is just silica. So it's very simple. But if if you could do that, that would be a great way to do it. Um, I would imagine, I don't know of such a prism, but in my past work experience, I used to work with liquid crystal on silicon elbows. And so you could electronically manipulate it to change the refractive index and stuff like that. And uh, so you could imagine, I, I thought about 
using that for this? And yes, we did. But I said, absolutely not, because working with an elk horse is horrible. It, it is super sensitive to uh, imbalances of, of certain uh, oscillating voltages. It's super sensitive to temperature and temperature gradients around it. So, so I would imagine that some of, at least some of those things would be true for a prism that could change or, or a material that could change refractive index like that. Exactly. Uh, I think the issue here yeah. is rather than prisms, it's finding a material that change uh, reliably, it's refractive and fast as well. And faster. Because we change the, the wavelength of light almost instantaneously. Yeah. It's electronically driven, it's laser. Um, so, you know, we go from any wavelength to any wavelength of less than 50 nanoseconds. Um, whereas if, if it is something like that, I, I would imagine. I don't know. Temperature, for example, could be something, right? That you could do to no, change the magnetic field temperature. Well, magnetic field could thing be fast. Is, yeah, yeah. Another thing is actually uh, creating, uh, say, mechanical motion on the material in such a way that with high frequency, just like the ultrasonic so that you can actually create pressure waves within the material, which pressure waves basically means the change of the reflective index. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, something like to be honest, this is. Uh, used quite a bit in military domain as well. Yeah. yeah. So the modulators. Yes. Yeah. And not necessarily on the optical field, but you know the density, or for example, in simplest form, if you think it's out just like a quartz crystal or a glass with a uniform density in parentheses. In case if you can uh, produce pressure waves within that material, you are literally changing the density of that material, which reflects to the uh, refractive index. And you can create these pressure waves not on, on a plane, but you can actually create these pressure waves in theory. It's not easy to do in small size. It generally requires larger scales. You can create these pressure waves in three dimensions within that body, so that steering could be much more complex. And furthermore, you can also using this, you can also look at the polarization. For example, what I if I miss that, for example, so far on discussion, there is nothing about the polarization of the reflected light. Yeah. That might be quite a bit useful modality as well. Yeah. 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 So Ali, you should put a patent on that technology. <laughs> Could you report any more discussion or something? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm not an optics expert. I've learned on the job, uh, but I'll make sure to pass on your ideas to my co-founder. Yeah. yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, the, when you look at the fundamental level, there is nothing new around <coughs> here. You know, the, you know. Oh yeah, the idea is yeah. Newtonian optics, right? I mean, exactly, yeah. super old. It's uh. So when we started the company, we spent five months trying to figure out if it was a bad idea because it sounded too simple, right? So two options, either it doesn't work or if it does work, someone else has the patent. And it turns out it works and no one has the patent. So we have both now. But it, we thought it was, a, chances were that it was a bad idea. Yeah. I was gonna ask a quick question about the, the range of different wavelengths that you move through and if that affects sensitivity at the top versus the bottom, but you mentioned it's only a kind of 20 nanometer window that you're scanning. I guess the other question I was gonna ask of that is what, what are the design considerations that go into choosing the 1500 nanometer window? Why, why not something you know, like shorter wavelengths or longer wavelengths? Yeah, that's a great question. So. There's two answers. The first one is the real answer, and the other one is then the afterthought. The real answer is we, the, this window, 1550 plus minus 1550 nanometers, 1500 nanometers yeah. plus minus 20 nanometers, is called the optical C band. And it's a telecom standard. And that laser already existed for that wavelength, and that's where our background was. Yeah. So that's the that's how we started using it. Uh, after that, we started thinking, oh my God, is this a good idea to be using this band or not, right? And it turns out it's a fantastic idea, but that, that we learned after. So uh, first of all, in 1550 nanometers, when, when th this, there's a consideration of eye safety, uh, that wavelength doesn't get focused to the back of the eye in the retina. Instead, it gets 
diffuse and absorbing the uh, aqueous humor. Um, so why is that important? Because it doesn't get focused. It is more eye safe than other frequencies like visible light that actually gets focused. Why is that important? Because it means I can put out a lot more power without burning people's eyes than if I were using a different wavelength. And why is that important? Because that means I can see further because I can put more power than using alternative frequencies. Uh, another consideration that you should have if you were to do this kind of from first principles is solar irradiation or, or illuminance is seven times lower at this wavelength yeah. than in other wavelengths closer to the visible and, and near infrared or kind of mid, mid infrared. So it means that you're naturally gonna be lower noise, right? The, the environment is gonna have lower natural light in, in your wavelength, yeah? And then the third one is water absorption, which uh, is actually super high at 15, 15 nanometers. Uh, but the main, but, but what I mean by super high is about, you know, 10 dBs uh, per 10 kilometers in high humidity air or something like that. So in the range that we are discussing is not really relevant. It could be relevant with rain and, and ponds of water, but it turns out that the dominant effect is not the absorption, it's the refraction when you keep the water droplet, it just sends the light somewhere else. And that happens to all of the different LIDARs, not just to our LIDAR. So 15, 50 nanometer LIDAR is emerging as the dominant long range high performance LIDAR, whereas uh, the other ones uh, are staying confined to the realm of short to medium range because they cannot afford to put more power because they hit the eye safety limit. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're at two o'clock. Yes, uh, we just thank Federico again for the wonderful <laughs>